point, uh, we'll do a short Q&A with Shantanu. Um, you know, he, again, by the way, formal introduction, it's Padma Shri Shantanu. I'm sorry, I missed the Padma Shri part. But again, hearing firsthand from a CEO who runs a $150 billion plus market cap company, 40 years old, and one of the most respected software product companies in the world would be a privilege. So, Shantanu, if I could please uh, do the Q&A now. It's a Q and A. I thought I'll ask the first question. <laughs> well, again, in terms of you know the talent, okay. as actually uh, you know you did mention, we do have a presence in India. The India presence was actually set up before I joined the company at Adobe in '98. I finished 25 years uh, next year. Uh, but, you know, we really feel like this is the place. We were incubating something right now. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I did the second best thing, which is I've at least, you know, introduced I think, well, to four or five other CEOs uh, who have all created their presence here. And so, we are doing some work in artificial intelligence, as we all know. AI is the one area where the world's going to be changed. It's one of the most tectonic shifts. That is an area we are investing in. So, Shantanu, this year, I mean, Thai Global Summit is in your hometown of Hyderabad. So, can we start by talking a little bit about your journey and your background and how you went from Hyderabad to where you are today? Well, again, as I said, uh, you know, I mean, all the privileges that I got were from Hyderabad. I went, I went first to Vidyaranya, which was, uh, as we all know, a very small nurturing school. And then uh, I went to public school. So, I was in public school all the way till I graduated. And I think public school was, you know, one of those places where you got this incredible education. Um, I was the editor of the school magazine, I was in debates. I think I tried to do everything but academics. Uh, and then I went to Usmania uh, to do electronics because I was fascinated by what was happening uh, in Usmania. Uh, and in my final year here, I think I was really <laughs> taken up by microprocessors. And so computer science became my passion. Uh, you know, in those days, everybody went to the States to study, and I guess I got the opportunities there. But, you know, I think the main thing that I would say about, you know, what you got here is it's the high school education and the college education that teaches you how to think, and for that, I'm really grateful. So Adobe is, uh, to this year, celebrating four decades in business, right, 40 years, and Adobe India, I think it's 25th anniversary year. What underpins the company's success globally as well as in India? You know, I, since all of you are entrepreneurs, the one thing I would say was that Adobe was founded with this fundamental belief that our mission is we want to change the world through digital experiences. And if you think about the video that you're consuming on the internet, the mobile application that you're using, a newspaper that you might read, a magazine, the gaming that happened, you know, I think Adobe revolutionized every aspect of that. And, you know, when we think about it, uh, you know, my goal as CEO is to just say, uh, we cannot be in a position where all we're trying to do is preserve the status quo. And I think entrepreneurship and everything that you are engaged in is never taking no for an answer. And so the company has always found a way. We were the first company on the planet to move to software as a service. We completely transitioned our business model from a, a desktop business model to a subscription-based business model. We're now in digital marketing. That's become a $4 billion business. So, you know, I, I think what's characterized Adobe is that we're always willing to look around the corner. We're always willing to uh, make change. And I think that's what is required. So, Shantan, we're just touching upon the same topic. 15 years ago, you took over as CEO, and you made one of the boldest moves to go from, you know, to just to move to a subscription model. How did you get the conviction that you were doing the right thing? Because, I mean, today this is the way software is sold. But back then, I mean, when you're walking away from billions of dollars of perpetual licensing to subscription, did you have any doubts? Or how did you get the conviction that you were doing the right thing? Well, I took over in 2007, as, yeah. and as Vijay said, I'm probably one of the more senior uh, tech uh, you know, CEOs right now. And, uh, in 2007, I took over. In 2008, we had record revenues. And I said, wow. how hard could this be? Even I can do the job. Uh, and then the recession hit in 2009. 
And the thing that I would always tell, again, entrepreneurs is that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So in 2009, when the recession, when in 2009, when the recession hit, Adobe's revenue fell by about 25% because we were considered a discretionary purchase. And the thing that we were not doing was we were not innovating at the pace at which the market was evolving. Everything was moving to the cloud. Mobile devices were just emerging. And so uh, I remember thinking that as a management team, we all said that we really need to make sure that we can innovate at a faster pace. And when we weren't innovating at a faster pace because of financial accounting standards bodies, you know that something is wrong because the main thing that you have to all focus on is customers. And I think customers don't always know how to solve their pain point, but they recognize what the pain point was. So, you know, in retrospect, BJ was actually a pretty simple decision. We had these traditional 12 or 18 month product cycles. We weren't innovating at the pace at which we needed to innovate. And so we took the bold move at that point of saying we will move to a subscription. And so our revenue dropped again by 25%, because as you pointed out, you don't recognize revenue up front, you recognize it. And so our EPS dropped by 65% in the first year. Now at that point, our market cap went down to about 6 billion. Uh, eventually it got back up, as you said, it's you know, closer to 200 billion. So things worked out. And the good news is because things worked out, I'm here telling you the story. Otherwise, my successor would be here telling you what a bad idea that was. Well, I think, uh, Shantanu, clearly this is going to be one of the legacies that you'll be remembered for. So, congratulations on that. Now, as a leader of a very successful company like Adobe, how do you continue to inspire and motivate teams to achieve their next ambition and to continually keep disrupting? I think the amazing thing that's going, I mean, you think about the demographics of India, you think about the demographics of Hyderabad, uh, you know, at the end of the day, your biggest, biggest uh, real treasure is your people. And if you don't realize, uh, we're in the intellectual property business, and when pre-COVID, when people worked uh, in the office, we used to say, our intellectual property goes home every night, and hopefully they come back the next day. Uh, so the way I think, you know, you try and stay young, the way you try and stay curious, yeah, is to really surround yourself by these scary, smart people. And so college hiring is a big thing that we do. Uh, we may not have a big presence here yet, but we do hire a lot of people uh, who go for schools here. And so one of the things that I've learned is, you know, by surrounding yourself, what happens unfortunately is the most senior you get, very few people tell you that you have bad ideas. Suddenly all my ideas seem good ideas, except when they're college graduates. And I think it's amazing how much college graduates inspire you by the force of their ideas and by looking around the corner. So, you know, I, I try and pay it forward by, if you have somebody who has a good idea. I mean, think about it. What the venture community did amazingly well, what the venture community did amazingly well is, if you have a good idea, all you need is one person to say, yes. Yeah. somebody like Bonnie, uh, you know, who knows how to find entrepreneurs. If you say yes, she's going to invest in you. What happens in larger companies is that you have to get everybody to say yes and nobody to say no. And I think if you can try and keep changing that, and that's something that I keep trying to change within Adobe. I want to be the company that if somebody has a good idea and you have one executive who's willing to say yes, then we fund it. And that's very different as we know from uh, other companies, but a model that we see is defining. Now, it's never been more important for companies to build trust with customers and also stand for something bigger than their own businesses. What do you believe is the role companies should play? I, you know, just to, to quickly, greatest companies in the world, and we celebrated 40 years last week, and 40 years, I think, in tech is one of those amazing accomplishments. We consider ourselves young, but there are very few companies. And I, I think at the end of the day, as all of you are starting companies, the advice that I would give you is think about your mission, think about your vision, but also think about purpose. And I believe that most people do their best work when they resonate with the vision of the company, but they also identify with the values of the company. And so I'll give you one example of what we are doing, is we all know there's so much content that's being produced through Adobe software. We think a lot about 
what we call the content authenticity initiative, which is how do you combat all of this misinformation that's happening, and by providing attribution, by using AI to understand when content has changed, by thinking about provenance, by partnering with distributors and people monetizing that content. So it's just one example of if you have a clear purpose, and at Adobe we say our purpose is creativity for all, anybody who has a story to tell, we want them to tell that story, and we think about technology to transform. We all know technology transforms BJ, but if you can think about it in terms of how it's doing good, because the biggest attribute that you have on your balance sheet is your relationship with customers. So we think about it. It's one of those things that takes decades to build up, but you can lose overnight if you do the wrong thing. Fantastic. Now, Adobe is known for seeing around corners. What are the big paradigm shifts that you see in technology today? Well, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I, I really feel like if I was starting my career right now, in addition to starting it in Hyderabad, uh, I would really think about the confluence of what's happening between technology and healthcare. Uh, there are billions of people for whom personalized medicine is going to become a reality. I'm fortunate enough to serve on the board of Pfizer. And so as I think about artificial intelligence, at the end of the day, what computers do better than anybody else is that they pattern match. And I think medicine is also one of those areas where you're trying to find it. So of all the technology trends that I'm really excited about, if you haven't looked at some of the new things that people are talking about as it relates to generative AI and what all of these chip companies are doing, that's an area in particular that I think is fascinating and an area where people are going to incubate a whole bunch of companies. And you know, with the population of the world, I think there's going to be a significant amount of good that can be done and a significant amount of money that can be made. That's it. Now it's clear that digital has forever changed how businesses across industries deliver their services and engage with customers and partners. What are some of the key shifts businesses need to make to capitalize on the opportunities to drive growth in a fully digitalized world? And I know that Adobe partners with some of the biggest brands in the world. What are you seeing and hearing from these large customers? Maybe two uh, quick things. Uh, the first thing I would say is, you have to know your customers. And I think you know what digital enables you to do more than any other technology is know exactly who your customer is and deliver a personalized experience. So we call it personalization at scale. You were telling me about your startup and what your startup is trying to do is with the entire housing market, how can you provide a service that's personalized? And so I think personalization is one of these things because with digital you can create profiles and you can do an amazing job. And you talked about partnerships. The one area that we have partnered is uh, Satya and I, uh, you know, we were one of the first companies to double down on Azure as a cloud. And I think together we're really working on making sure that we can enable every company to do it. And a company like Nike, for example, now uses it where they're engaging with every customer so you can create your personalized shoe. So that's, I think, an example of it doesn't matter which industry you're in, if you're in the hospitality business, if you're in the telecommunications business, if you're in the healthcare business, if you don't know who your customer is, you're going to provide a generic service. And I think people's appetite for a generic service is non-existent. Fantastic. So I'm going to close with my final question. It's going to be a little bit of a personal question. I know your parents live in Hyderabad. They're 92 and 87. What were they more proud of you for? For taking a six billion value company to close to 200 billion, or for having been awarded the Padma Shri? Oh, without a question, I woke them up uh, when I received the Padma Shri. I mean, I, again, it's one of these amazing things that, you know, I was, I was actually in Hawaii that night, and my phone kept ringing with a 415 number, which, as you know, is a Bay Area number, and I wasn't answering the phone. And I guess it turns out that if you're a non-Indian uh, citizen, I am an OCI, but if you're a non-Indian citizen, if you don't accept it, they actually don't put your name on the list. And so finally, after you know, 11 phone calls, I answered it. Uh, but the first phone call I made was to my parents. And you know, as a person of Indian origin, to get one of the highest awards of the land, I mean, what else? But hopefully, hopefully more than any of that, they will say I was a good son.
No, you actually made the whole country proud, not just your parents. We are indeed privileged to have had you with us today. And by the way, it was not just your phone ringing. The Consul General was calling me as well at four in the morning saying, where is Shantanu? I can't get a hold of him. And so... Uh, Thank you for giving him my number. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, PTR, any questions from you? Final questions before we wrap? The only question, of course, I, I keep asking him, of course, I think I asked him as it first up front. I want him to expand a little green hands about I think I've said it enough tonight. I think you don't want to say it again. Uh, but of course, you know, like he said, uh, you know, he's achieved amazing, amazing heights, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, 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 in, in the technology world. And he was just telling me before we walked on stage how the next year, the, the next one decade, or so is going to be India's, uh, you know, in terms of uh, technology and what opportunities it presents. But my question to you, Shantanu, would be, you know, I think we are in the, the learning curve, the growth stage, possibly where the U US uh, was, say, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. So in terms of leapfrogging or in terms of literally pole vaulting, what do you suppose are the challenges that we as Indian entrepreneurs, Indian governments, are going to run into over the next one decade? And how do we ensure that uh, we learn from the best, that is the US and the West, in terms of ensuring that our entrepreneurs, our ecosystem thrives and, and does much better? What they've done in 30 years, how, we, how could we do that in the next 10 years? Well, the first time that I, you know, was, I had the pleasure of meeting you, I remember how both Jayesh and you were impatient. <laughs> and I think being impatient for progress is being unreasonable unreasonable expectations uh, is absolutely the way to go. I think two things that I've done for entrepreneurship. Uh, the first is you have to celebrate failure as well. I think way too often we only talk about successes. And as we know, the number of people when they're creating companies who have to change. And so I, I think that's one of these things. In the Bay Area, it is absolutely fine to know somebody who's tried and not necessarily succeeded, but learns from that experience. Uh, so I think how we can create a culture here in Hyderabad where, you know, people who are willing to share the lessons that they've learned from mistakes, I think that's one thing if you can do with the community. But the second thing is, I, I think these are generational shifts and the first generation, it was things to do with outsourcing, then it was things to do with the Indian uh, ecosystem, as you pointed out in your speech. I think the aspirations of Hyderabad and the entrepreneurs have to be that the world is their oyster and they're going to create global companies. And so the more I think you can, uh, you know, evangelize the successful companies, the one that you mentioned, Skyro, you know, trying to do what Vikram Sarabhai is doing, trying to do what they're doing in healthcare, the Krishi stuff and, you know, helping with farming, sustainable energy and the work that's happening there. And so uh, I know both of you have been tireless in doing that, but I think the more you do that, whether it's at Davos, whether it's at Taiwan, worldwide. I think people want to also follow successes. So thank you uh, as well for your contribution in this case.